good to go? Yep, it's streaming now. All right. Well, thank you. And I want to welcome everybody to our January 28th meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order and get a certification of quorum, please. Yes, we have more than 50% of the members present. Thank you, Karen. So I just have a few uh, opening remarks. Um, as most of you know, uh, British Columbia had some severe floods uh, in mid-November. And I just wanted to thank the GRC staff. There were many staff who were willing to step up and go out and help during the holiday season. It, at the end of the day, they weren't needed, but I just wanna give a shout out to all of those staff who were willing to give up their holidays to go out there and, and help those folks in their time of need. It, it's a good indication of who the staff are. So congratulations on that. Um, following board direction, Samantha has now met with most of our participating municipalities to initiate discussions on the updated regulations under the Conservation Act. Initial conversations with senior municipal staff have gone well, and Samantha will continue the meetings throughout the implementation process. Notification of the 2022 budget has been sent to participating municipalities, including the draft 2022 budget packet included later in this agenda. Samantha and Sonia presented the draft budget to the city of Hamilton on January 18th, and these presentations will continue as requested by municipalities. So if you want one, just ask. On January 26th, the province released a consultation guide for phase two regulatory and policy proposal, which focuses on regulations related to municipal levies, budget processes, transparencies, and charging of service fees. The guideline document has been distributed to the board and the environmental registry posting will remain open for comment for 30 days. Staff will be thoroughly reviewing the guidelines and preparing a full report for the board in, at our February meeting prior to submitting our comments to the province. Okay, so that's my opening remarks and we'll just get right at it. I'm looking for, I have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated. Can I move by Marcus, seconded by Brian. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Hearing and seeing none, minutes of the previous. Motion that the minutes of the general membership meeting of December 17th, 2021 be approved as circulated. Moved by Kathy, seconded by Bernie. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Business arising, nothing there. So we have delegations. So we've got Marco, Jim and Tony with regards to the pheasant hunt at Conestoga Lake. So if we could just bring them in, uh, we'll go from there. Hello, Jim. I see you. There's Tony. Okay, good. I'm not, can you folks hear me? The pheasant folks? Chair, could you please, um, Awen's trying to find out who's on that phone number, if they could identify themselves. It may be one of the uh, individuals on the pheasant thing. Sure. It's a 239 number, so it's 239, I believe, Owen. I, um, I actually haven't allowed them to join the meeting. All three delegations are in. All three okay. delegations are here? Okay. Yep. So you still don't know who that number is? I don't. They're not in the meeting, though. They're in the waiting room. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm not sure, Jim, Marco, or Tony, who's taking the lead here, so I'll just turn it over to you. Marco, or are you the lead delegate here? Can you hear us? Might be on mute. Okay. Yeah, I can't see anything because of the slides. Jim, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Mario is supposed to be uh, starting as well. Mario is the, Mario. Okay, sorry, I I got mispronounced that. Okay, Mario, if you're uh, if you can hear us, the floor is yours. Maybe he's the one in the waiting room. Well. I think Eowyn can. Oh. No, um, his name is on the screen. I'm just trying to get a better picture so that I can see if I can request he, that he unmute himself. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Mario. Welcome, Mario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the slight delay here. In, Not at in, all. Set up. Um, 
Well, my name is Mario Cornelio, and on, on behalf of our delegation, I'd like to thank you for making time in your uh, very busy agenda today concerning the canceled pheasant hunt at the Conestoga Lake Conservation Area. Besides myself, our delegation includes Jim Baker, who is president of the Ontario Grand River chapter of the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, or, or NAVDA. This organization has just under 9,000 members scattered throughout the United States and Canada. The other delegation member is uh, Tony Jackson. Tony is a provincial director at large of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. And this, mem this uh, organization has uh, over 100,000 members and 725 member clubs and is the voice of angling and hunting in Ontario. Uh, in the southwestern Ontario region alone, there are some 24,000 members who live and recreate in this area. Both NAVDA and the Federation have a history of successful collaborations with conservation authorities, as well as various levels of government. So can I have the, the next slide, please? This is an outline of where we're gonna take you on this presentation. First, uh, I'm gonna ask Jim to spend a couple of minutes telling us about upland bird hunting in Ontario. That'll give us the, the context that you need to appreciate uh, what we're uh, trying to message in, in this presentation. Then I'm going to come back to the floor and talk about the cancellation of the pheasant hunt and look at that uh, in view of the GRCA's strategic priorities. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about program delivery, some of the aspects, of the financial operational model, at least the pieces that we were able to put together and, and look at how we might be able to even improve it. We'll conclude the request to the board. And at, at that point, I'll invite Tony to talk about uh, a hunting a liaison committee, which is one of the things that we are going to uh, request. Sorry, Mayor, so, I just want to just want to point out that just so we're clear, there's about a 10 minute time frame here, okay? Just well, okay. I was told that 20, 20 minutes, uh, but by yeah. that's correct. Okay, I guess it's a multiple delegation. My, my mistake. Just wanted okay. to point that out. Thanks, Mario. Uh, I think I may need to take a drink. Uh, <laughs> that's a bit of news, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, so uh, yeah, we've got 20 minutes and we will take less than that, uh, certainly. Sure. Um, so I'm going to turn the, the floor over now to uh, Jim to tell us uh, a little bit about upland bird hunting in Ontario, and then he'll pass it back to me. Hey, thanks, Mario. So this is just a bit of context uh, as to why the uh, hunt, uh, pheasant hunt at Conestoga was established. Uh, the, uh, the pheasants and great partridge populations, uh, ones that were fairly significant in this part of Ontario, and they have declined uh, since... Uh, well, really the 1930s, 1940s. And there were regular, pheasants were regularly hunted into the 70s in this area. And uh, as well, uh, great partridge or Hungarian partridge is the other name for this species, uh, were also hunted a, a little bit later. They've declined more in the 80s. The, um, this decline is not just you know, to Ontario, it's occurred across uh, the US as well through the, uh, the Midwest. Uh, U.S. and so on. And a lot of this decline is due to a, a number of factors. One is intensive agriculture, uh, lots of wetlands, lots of habitat in general, urbanization, predators, uh, raccoon populations, what, that sort of thing. So that was a bit of a, I think, an, uh, led to the establishment of the, uh, the hunt at Conestoga. So next slide, please. So it was started in the mid '70s, and the uh, the program uh, in 2020 included a number of other uh, hunting programs, and that included uh, deer, small game, migratory birds. The uh, there was a, a fair, I think GRCA charged a fairly good price for a lot of these hunting opportunities, and there was uh, a fairly big demand for them, and, and people were willing to pay for them. And we had a number of our members in our local Ontario uh, Grand River Club were uh, hunted there regularly. And the uh, one of the the requirements to hunt there was that people had to be uh, a member of the Ontario Federation of Angels and Hunters because of the uh, the liability insurance that's carried by all members. So that's a bit of context to the uh, the, the Conestoga hunt. Oh, and by the way. Uh, there was also a hunt, a pheasant hunt at Luther Marsh during the 2000s. Uh, I think from about 2000, to, I think when it was canceled around 2012, something like that. Anyway, I'll turn it back over to uh, Muriel. 
great. Um, so if we can have the next slide, uh, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Jim. So the, uh, the text at the top of this slide, is almost 60 words in length, is the notification that hunters receive that a 45 year long successful program was being canceled. The key words in this notification are overall operational review of our programs based on recent changes to the Conservation Authorities Act and ensuring that these programs align with our strategic priorities. The reasons for the, the cancellation uh, at best remain uh, opaque and moreover the reference to the alignment with the GRCA strategic priorities as I'll indicate in a, in a minute uh, are also ungrounded. The process leading to the decision was certainly not transparent and it was made without consultation nor consideration of the impact on its users. This much is a fact. The details of the decision process have not been accessible to us and there's no way to know whether there's been any effort to critically examine the existing operational model in light of whatever issues ultimately led to the cancellation. Accordingly, the other two points in this slide should be taken as, as sensible deductions. Can I have the, the next slide, please? We are certainly aware that the Ontario Conservation Authorities have been directed by the provincial government to focus on source water protection, climate impact, natural hazards, and increasing awareness of Indigenous issues. Non-core functions like recreation and education are equally important, however. For many, the land controlled by conservation authorities is their only access to highly valued recreational and educational opportunities. Connecting people to the environment is one of four strategic priorities of the GRCA. And I was very pleased to see that in item 12 of the today's agenda, that the report on this particular uh, strategic priority continues to have uh, uh, good success with uh, things that have happened and things that are planned to go forward. The hunting program at Conestoga is one of many programs where users pay fees, and that includes boating, fishing, swimming, and so on, just to, to name a few. It remains unclear how one hunting program, the pheasant program, can be singled out as not being aligned with strategic priorities, whereas the other hunting programs apparently are. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is... Uh, uh, a very simple financial model for what the 2020 program was like. We didn't have access to the details, but this is probably very close on the information we could get. In 2020, the program was sold out, 125 permits at $280 each. Now this $280 uh, figure, as uh, Jim pointed out uh, a few slides earlier, is the cheapest program that includes pheasants. The other two are, are $400 and $420. So let's use the, the minimum uh, price and that yields a, a net revenue of $35,000. The number of pheasants purchased was 1,600 for a total cost of roughly $16,000. And the net revenue was around uh, almost $19,000 minus administrative and logistical uh, costs, which I'd argue were relatively minor. The administrative costs were incremental to existing things that need, are needed to support hunting and other programs. And the logistical, logistical costs, of course, were related to the supplier. And, and uh, as I said, uh, these are, are minor. Now, can I have the, the next slide, please? The essential pieces of the pheasant hunt program are really quite simple. They were stocked in a number of areas in the Conestoga Lake property. There were two releases a week with a two bird limit per hunter and the hunt ran from early October to early December. Can I have the next slide? The point of this slide is to show that with adjusting just a, a simple variable, the number of pheasants that are stocked or, or decreasing the, the, the number of stocking areas rather, which would decrease uh, work and cost, that could reduce cost and resource demands on the Conestoga Lake uh, Conservation Authority uh, personnel. The other thing that is, we're gonna draw some attention to at, with the remainder of our, our conversation here today is that we need to partner with volunteers that also would have a very significant impact on, on the program. So can I have the, the next slide, please? We see a successful pheasant hunt program proceeding being the result of two key components. The first of these requires collaboration between the GRCA and a hunting liaison committee where a robust plan 
for pheasant hunting is created and eventually implemented. This approach will benefit from the experience of both the GRCA as well as the committee and promote transparency in dealing with issues that arise and of course the decisions that result. The second component is that volunteers, the people with a vested interest in the success of the plan, be involved in a variety of ways. And getting volunteers for something like this is the easy part. And of course, involving volunteers would benefit the GRCA with respect to both revenue and resources. That's it, next slide, please. Any uh, pheasant hunt model going forward should be underpinned by a healthy volunteer component. And this is nothing new. There are programs in other places in Ontario, such as the Hullet Marsh, the Tiny Marsh, and in Norfolk County, where volunteers play a role, either associated directly with the hunt, or they're involved in such act activities as trail maintenance, a cleanup, and so on. Net revenues generated could be used for habitat improvement or poured back into the GRCA to support other outdoor programs. And of course, this would generate a positive economic impact as people travel to and from the Conestoga Lake area quite often from a few hours away. Got the next slide, please. I'd like to leave you with, with a few more thoughts around this. There is an increasing demand for upland hunting in Ontario, and the people who are demanding this are more diverse than ever. The put and take nature of pheasant hunting is no different than the acclaimed brown trout fishery of the Grand River. Here, hatchery raised fish sustain a thriving sport fishery for Ontarians and those who visit from a further away, including other countries. And lastly, those who enjoy upland hunting opportunities are taxpayers like everyone else. And we can contribute to the running of conservation authorities and deserve highly valued recreational activities as do all other local taxpayers. This is the last one if, of our presentation and is our request. And that is respectfully to ask the GRCA Board of directors, uh, directors to direct the appropriate GRCA personnel to engage with the stakeholders to reestablish a hunting liaison committee. And I've underlined the word here, reestablish, because you'll see that the significance of that in a moment when I, when I call Tony to the floor. Their remit is simple, to develop a sustainable pheasant hunt program for the Conestoga Lake Conservation Area and to report back to the board of directors we're suggesting in a four month time frame. So with that, I'd like to ask Tony to tell us a little bit more about the Hunting Liaison Committee. Thank you, Mario, and thank you board uh, for the opportunity to speak briefly today. As was mentioned earlier, I'm the local representative um, for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, but I can also sympathize with the challenges and stresses you have as a board. As uh, like many of you here today, I also sit as a director for the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority. But uh, anyway, the, the Grand River uh, Hunting, sorry, the Grand River Conservation Authority Hunting Liaison Committee was initially born to deal with stakeholder concerns, but in reality, it was more about being a partner for the GRCA. To act as a sounding board for the GRCA staff and to share our knowledge and experience and the needs of the community the goal was so that the uh, GRCA might be able to make better decisions when it comes to hunting and hunting related matters. The meetings were generally two staff members of the GRCA, uh, always Jack Griffin and one other person usually, and uh, also a member from the Ministry of Natural Resources, typically that had been Al Murray in the past, and up to three people from the outdoors community, uh, myself being one of those people. Eventually, uh, MNR dropped out of the picture as a regular attendee, but uh, we're open for consultation on an as needed basis. We would meet a couple times a year to review the maps of the hunting areas, changes in boundaries, the programs and services being offered, such as the pheasant program, trends in use or demand, parking, access and accessibility, fees and fee adjustments, and the concerns, challenges and opportunities. The objective was to understand each party's needs and to maximize opportunities and to that end to ensure sustainability. So for example, I understand the GRCA is presently preparing for an internal review of your hunting policies to be presented to the board later this winter. 
this committee could be an excellent vehicle to use for that review as well to discuss and contribute to that process. As you already know, the hunters you allow on your properties are members of the OFAH and are covered through our OFAH members liability insurance. The OFAH and our members value the resource and the working relationship tremendously. So when your ecologist, Mr. Robert Messier, approached us, for example, for donation towards habitat enhancements in the same area where the pheasant hunt uh, takes place, the OFAH Zone J membership gladly supported donating $7,000 towards that project. And it's a win-win for everybody. It's not only about money, but uh, there's lots of volunteerism and in-kind opportunities available. When Mr. Griffin did retire, he did advise us that he was not sure if staff would continue supporting the liaison committee. And unfortunately, it seemed to end with his retirement. We certainly hope the board sees the benefit of partnerships in this previously used vehicle to help carry the freight and for a mutually benefit um, opportunity for all. Thanks. Back to you, Mario. Thanks, uh, Tony, for that. So in closing, uh, we'd like to thank you for listening to our presentation and for considering our request. We hope you see promise in the solution we propose. We are certainly willing to roll up our sleeves to see that the work gets done. So thank you. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, thank you very much for that comprehensive presentation. I see we've got a couple of questions from the board. Bernie, questions or comments? Yes, yes thank you very much. I certainly support the program. Uh, who's uh, administrating it? Uh, that is a question for me, I believe, in collaboration. And I understand what you're suggesting is that this uh, go back to staff for some supplementary report. Just in question to the presentation, you mentioned the $280 fee. You understand that includes all small game and therefore that cost is no, not totally uh, uh, an indication of how much you pay towards the program. Um, Norfolk County has mentioned and they have delegated or transferred uh, the pheasant program on to the Long Point Club. Is this something that the the Ontario Grand River dog chapter couldn't get into and make arrangements for uh, land use from, from the county. Uh, just some responses to that. Certainly want to see your program continued. I'm not sure with regard to uh, the generating uh, self-generating program, how much uh, our our board actually pays or conservation authority pays towards it and what management takes up. So I'm looking at a program that is managed by perhaps your, your dog organization for the logistics and collecting the fees. I do know the pheasant license purchase. I don't know who they purchase it from uh, pheasant license to hunt through your small game, whether your township or community gets some money for that. But our fees, uh, $280 as indicated, me doesn't include just pheasant hunting, it includes others, but I certainly support the program going forward and hopefully staff can take another look at it in consultation and collaboration with you. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, Sue? Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Good, 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 okay. Um, Staff has never done anything just because they want to. So there has to be some logic behind this. And this isn't really a question for the gentleman, but for staff and what was the reasoning and thought behind this process. So what we're gonna do, Sue, is- um, We can leave that and add to questions. Yeah, so staff is gonna, so staff will take this away. We've heard the delegation, we understand the concerns. Clearly we need some more detail around um, when that occurred. I'm sure there are, several members of the board who don't quite have the details on this program or the, certainly the op because a lot of it's operational. So I think what we will do without getting staff to try to answer that today is uh, we're gonna follow one of the recommendations which we had to have a report come back in the next couple of months so that the board can take a fulsome look at exactly what the program is and, and what the decision was 
and, and why it was made. If that's Thank you. okay, Sue, Richard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I must say you're doing a fine job today. And uh, to Tony and Mario, uh, thank you for a well present, a well put together presentation. Just one really quick question. You mentioned that the liability insurance is carried by all members of the OFHA. Can you tell me what the liability limit is on that? And have you how often have you updated that? And is it mandated that everyone be, be covered? Yes. Uh, so every member of the OFAH is covered under the yeah, yes, and what is the liability? What is the limit liability? Sorry, it's it's uh, I got muted there somehow, but uh, it's updated on a fairly regular basis. It was last uh, last time it was updated to five million, I believe. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you, Richard, Catherine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to the delegation, I uh, certainly understand the passion behind this particular group and um, just wondering where your members mostly come from, like the ones that actually uh, uh, paid for the permits and came to the hunt, where are your members usually located? Thanks for that que question. Um, I'll uh, attempt to answer it. I, I won't be able to give you details because um, those were not details that were allowed to be released to me. I did ask for a, um, a roster of uh, emails so I could contact uh, members who were affected by this decision. And uh, uh, privacy protection, of course, uh, did not allow the GRCA to release that. But I can tell you from a parking lot survey, uh, a very informal one of just people I encountered over a period of a couple of months, uh, an, uh, an astonishing, astonishingly large number of people come from the, uh, the GTA and even further afield to participate in this particular uh, program. And that is an, uh, that's a testament to just how good it was. And of course, we have the local community who are also uh, participants. Thank you. So it sounds to me like you think that most of your members are from Southern Ontario, Southwestern oh, Ontario. Oh, absolutely. So <laughs> our, our region. Uh, definitely Great. serving our region. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Bernie? Yeah, uh, with that uh, review be in collaboration with the group here? Not the initial review. Let, let's let staff put together what the decision that was made, bring that forward, and then we'll see what collaboration they want. I can't, I can't really answer that until we have staff take a look at it. We're certainly willing to talk to people, and we're certainly willing, you know, there may be some details there, but I don't think we let, let staff do an initial response to this, and then the board can decide the direction we want to go in. Does that work? Thank you. Is that, is that a fair response, staff? Sam, is that okay? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's the way to go. Let, let's, again, uh, I think for some of us, we, we don't really have all the details or operations or aren't that close to this. So an initial report back, what exactly this is, what exactly it takes the GRCA to run it, and, and some uh, look back on, on the cancellation and then look at next steps. And we recognize, should something go forward, I saw you've got an October, I'm sure it's much sooner than October. So we'll, we'll be moving on this at a, uh, at a reasonable pace to, to, get, to get things going, if that's all right. Great. Great. Bruce? Uh, well, just in case the other Bruce gets confused. <laughs> Sorry about that. I forgot how to operate the technology to let you listen to me. Just a, a quick question. The Luther Marsh was mentioned in your report and that program or that hunt had been canceled or discontinued in 20 or earlier than 2020. Are you requesting a review of, of that program as well or just the Conestoga Lake uh, hunt in, in particular? Our focus was certainly the Conestoga Lake Hunt. Um, I, I think it, it's important to, uh, to, to work at this in, in uh, bite-sized chunks, uh, demonstrate success. And you know, if, if it seems that uh, we can apply this to another area in the future, let, let's take that on. But I think the, uh, what we wanna do is, is address the issue at the Conestoga Lake Conservation uh, Area as, as our, our top priority. Okay, Bruce. All right. Uh, is there anything further from the board? All right. I want to again, thank you for your presentation. Very good. And we will get back to you. Well, well, we'll have something back to the board as, as quick as staff can put it together next month or two. 
March, April, and then we'll certainly be reaching back out. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't need a motion to receive that delegation, do I? No. I, for some reason, I can't find Sam on my screen. There she is. <laughs> it's funny how people disappear, right? And then you find out they're right in the middle of the screen. It's the weirdest thing. All right. So moving right along then, getting on to correspondence. I'm looking, I've got a motion that correspondence from the Honorable Greg Rickford regarding Conservation Authority assistance in relation to flooding in British Columbia and from the land back camp regarding the relationship between the Grand River Conservation Authority and the land back camp be received as information and uh, moved by John, seconded by Warren. And just a comment, and I'll get your question, Bernie. We will be responding to, to the land back camp um, correspondence. So just so we're clear, we will be having something on that. Bernie? Yes, if I may, a, a question in general is, uh, why is not the Six Nations and uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit members of the Conservation Authority? I tried to research this, and I, it said some reference to Section 60, but I understand they can be members of the association. <laughs> Why are they not members? Or can I get a question back or respond on that later? Certainly. Unless staff's got an answer now, do we want to take that back? Because I don't have an answer. And what do you mean by members? Sit up on the board? Like, what, what's the question? Yes, they have property on the Grand River or they're within their watershed. Why aren't they represented? I don't know what the answer is. Sam or Karen? Uh, Mr. Chair, we can certainly look into that, but I would just say that um, the Six Nations and the Mississauga, both their uh, reserves are in the Grand River, but they're actually exempt from our regulation. So because they're governed through federal legislation, provincial legislation doesn't apply to them, but we can certainly look into that further and come back to the board. Um, Thank you. I think Jane has... Sorry. If I may just add, uh, Mr. Chair. They are municipalities, so under the, the legislation, they aren't identified as being um, a, a municipality who can be a member of a conservation authority, but certainly we can look into the, I'm sure there is greater legal clarification on that that we can provide to the board. Jane, go ahead. You're going to yeah, jump out when, of your seat. Yeah, yeah. when I um, asked that question many years ago. Uh, when I was first on the board, I was told that they did not want to be. Can you hang on just part. a sec. I'm sorry. Can can everybody oh. mute their mics? We got. Oh, can you not hear me? Somebody's watching the Teletubbies. Okay, go ahead, Jane. <laughs> okay. Um, when they um, when I first was on the board, I asked that very question, and I was also told that they did not want to be part of the Grand River Conservation Authority because they felt that they would only be talking to. They should only be talking to the federal government and that they should only have that relation. I mean, we can ask them again, but that was the, the answer that I got back. Okay. Thanks, Jane. And we will have staff look at it. I'm... Okay. Sue? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I believe that they sit on other committees on the GRCA, um, but um, in regards to... Uh, the uh, email, we will, should be dealing with the Six Nations or others um, and not to these split groups because it gets really messy if we really don't go to the proper, um, let's say, authority. Uh, so, um, and yeah, we can explore. I think they probably would, in, at times have changed. I think they probably would like to get on the board. Uh, but again, legislation, we'd have to look into the legislation of that, which I would ask staff to do to see if um, that's a possibility. Because uh, you're right, they do fall under the federal government, but things are very fluid right now and changing. So I think staff need to look into it further and see if it's a possibility. And it may be a good will gesture, but we have to be careful on who we invite and who is the actual authority and who are splinter groups. Okay. So staff has the question. They will take that back and we will look at it. And as you'll see further down in the, um, agenda we, we do have as, as, as a, an, a, 
an update to the strategic plan, of course, the indigenous issues and, and how we will work on those moving forward. So those questions will be answered at that time. Is that all right, Sam? Or did you have something you wanted to add? Okay. Um, so, sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could just add a, a, one other comment and just uh, thank the Land Back Camp for providing the feedback that they did. They certainly identified um, a few issues and, and things that the GRCA can work on. And like you mentioned before, um, with the update to the strategic plan, it's one of the key uh, strategic priorities that we've identified to include in the update moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, did I get a mover and a seconder for the correspondence motion? I'll do it again. John? Uh, yeah, John again? and Warren. You have, All right, uh, thanks. John and Warren. Thanks very much. Um, any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Moving right along to 12.1, I have a motion that the minutes of the Ad Hoc Conservation Authorities Act Committee held on January 14, 2022 be received as information. Moved by Jerry, seconded by Joan. Any comments or questions on that? Again, we're just plowing our way through the regulations and uh, we've got the new, the second stuff just came out a couple of days ago. So lots of stuff to look at. Uh, if there are no comments or questions, I will ask, are there any opposed? That is carried, thank you. 12.2, draft inventory of programs and services. I'm just gonna let Sam do the presentation and I'll put the motion on the floor. Sam? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just gonna get organized here. So just as Karen pulls up the, the presentation here, we're back to the board to talk about another requirement under the Ontario Regulation 687-21, which is the Transition Plan and Agreements for Programs and Services Regulation. So in terms of this presentation, um, you know, in previous reports, we have identified a number of requirements that um, the Conservation Authority has to go through to come into conformance with the regulations. So this is the second component that's required under the Transition Plan and Agreements Regulation before we can begin our negotiation with municipalities on municipal driven programs and services. So back in December, the board approved the Transition Plan, which identified the steps the GRCA will use to develop the inventory of current programs and services, and the process we would use to enter into agreements with participating municipalities to fund the Category 2 programs and services. So today we're bringing before the board a draft of the program inventory, and I'm gonna walk the board through the package to identify the process that we went through to develop this inventory and the major assumptions that we made. And then based on this discussion today, staff will incorporate any comments, suggestions, refinements to the inventory and bring back an updated version for approval at the February board meeting. Once the inventory has been approved, staff will then proceed to negotiations with the participating municipalities in preparation for the revised budgeting framework that will be implemented for the 2024 budget. So this slide is just to remind the board um, it's a lot of information and I apologize that it's a bit dry, but just to remind them of, of what is required with the inventory. So we bought through the transition plan. This is the categorization of all of our current programs and services that we have to go through to um, develop the inventory. So category one programs and services are the programs and services identified under the mandatory programs and service regulation. So these are regulated programs that we have to provide and they're, um, they'll be funded through a levy. The second category is the municipal requested programs and services. These fall under the transition plan and agreement regulation. And so these are programs and services that the municipality asks us to provide. We can fund them through memorandums of understanding with the municipalities, supplement them with government grants, and we also have the option to use some GRCA revenue. And then finally, the other category, those are the programs and services that are driven by the board or at the request of the board. We can approach municipalities as well to get into MOUs to fund those programs, but traditionally we're proposing that most of them be funded through special agreements, which are usually with a specific municipality or another agency funded through government grants or other additional GRCA revenue.
So, um, again, the, the inventory programs and services followed the similar process to the transition plan. So we did bring a draft of the inventory to the ad hoc committee, and then we're bringing it towards the board today. So just a few items to recognize about this. We do anticipate that the inventory is an evolving document. And as we work our way through this process, it will go through several refinements. Um, the refinements will be based on further discussions with municipalities on the Category 2 MOUs, but also further discussions um, in terms of with staff, in terms of the program and the evolution of the programs. So you may see some changes, particularly with Category 2 and 3, which are the municipal driven and the board driven programs and services. The current programs and service list is based on our financial reporting structure that we use to present the annual budget, financial updates to the board and internal financial management reports. And we chose to present the inventory in this way so that it's easy to compare the historical financial information. One critical thing to note about this um, when you're looking at the, the different charts is that um, our current staffing model creates synergies amongst the programs whereby staff perform tasks and duties that provide services across different programs. So that could result in staff programs and different departments fitting into a number of categories and a number of um, sort of the schedules that you see on your report. So just to give you an example, we have our conservation area staff. Um, they support water control structures and flood control, which is a category one program. They also provide um, support to conservation land management, which again is a category one. And then they um, provide services and run the conservation areas, our, our conservation area system, which is considered a category three. So just wanted to highlight when you're looking through the charts Although you're seeing the different um, financial um, schedules identified, there could be multiple staff that fit into those, um, those categories. So as things evolve and we continue with negotiations, we will be bringing um, any adjustments that are made to the inventory to the board. We're also required to submit quarterly reports to MECP and post on our website. So we'll certainly be running those through the board before they get posted or submitted. And based on the draft inventory and corresponding financial requirements for category one and two programs and services, there doesn't appear to be a significant change in the municipal financial support required compared to the current levy um, funding model. So basically what I just mean there is category one and two, the cost of those programs and services generally line up with the general levy that we have under the current process that we use for budgeting. So we're not seeing a significant difference um, which would then impact the amount of levy that we're requesting annually from municipalities. Additionally, just to keep in mind as well, and you've probably seen in some of the reports that are further on in, in the agenda, we do have a transition reserve that is there to assist with any costs related to going through this process. So whether that be legal, consulting, or administrative, and it can also provide supplemental funding to programs where there may be minor gaps of funding um, as a result of this change in funding framework and where new regulatory deliverables are required. Okay, so the first chart I'm gonna walk you through is chart A. Um, let me just figure out, that is I believe page, starts on page 36. So all of these charts that we are providing you today um, together form the inventory and are basically identified in the regulations in terms of the information that we have to provide. Um, and these are, again, once it comes back to the board in February, will be posted on our website for anybody to look at. So this initial chart identifies, again, the program and service, categorizes it, is it into either one, two, or three categories, identifies the section of the legislation that justifies the categorization, You'll see a description of the program, which again, they follow very similar to the descriptions that you would see in the budget for the program areas. And then it also identifies the regulatory section that is applicable to that program and service. So I'm just gonna give you a full example, a couple examples. I'm not gonna walk through the entire um, chart, but again, coming back to the flood forecasting and warning, it's categorized as a category one. It's identified under 
um, 21.1 of the Act, which is related to natural hazards. We talk about the description, so we give a high-level description of what the program does. And then under the mandatory programs and services, it's identified in Section 2, which is a flood forecasting and warning. So on page 37, I'll just give you another example. You've got resource planning. So the natural heritage, sorry, the natural hazard component of the resource planning program is a category one. And then directly below it, you'll see that the natural heritage component of resource planning is a category two, which is a program and service that would require an MOU um, with the municipality to continue to deliver. So some key considerations just to keep in mind when reviewing this chart is that the, as uh, Chair White had mentioned, the phase two consultation guide has just been released. The regulations that will fall out of that consultation guide will have an impact on the financial components of this as well. And um, when we developed this draft, that obviously the consultation guide wasn't out yet. So we were making some assumptions related to the financial components. In terms of the GRCA corporate costs, um, which represent administrative overhead, we have chosen to uh, um, identify them separately in the inventory. So if you flip all the way to page 41 and 42, you'll see that we separated out the corporate services that support category one programs and services. And then you'll also see below it, we've identified corporate services that support category three, which are the other programs and services that are driven by the board. Another key thing is you'll see throughout the inventory and the applicable program areas that we've also identified where the six deliverables that are identified in the mandatory programs and services um, so that's the, for example, the ice management plan, the land inventory, we slotted them into the appropriate schedule there. Um, at this point in time, we're still scoping out the extent of what it will take to meet those deliverables. But that being said, again, we have the transition reserve that can provide any additional funding requirements that would be needed to support the creation of these deliverables. And then finally, you'll note that we do identify land acquisition and disposition. Um, in the chart under, it's under schedule 11 or item 11 on page 39. And those will continue to be funded through the land sale um, proceeds reserve. So on to the next chart. Um, so that'll be chart B. So you'll see here that this provides an overview of costs and identifies percentages of revenue. So when you're looking at this, again, you've got the same sort of reference number, um, inventory, program and service name, categorization. You'll see the total expenses based on the 2022 budget. Then you'll see a number of percentages of revenue sources. So we have municipal levy, MOUs, provincial and federal funding, self-generated program revenue, which is really our user fees. You'll see self-generated revenue other, which is revenue that we get from our property rentals or hydro. And then finally, you'll see the reserve column. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to highlight here is under the regulation, it does require us to provide the average annual cost of each program and service based on the five-year average. So you don't see that here today. And that's because we've decided that the most reflective number in terms of expenses for the cost, considering we have such a growing watershed and demand for our programs and services, is the most recent budgeted numbers. That being said, it is a requirement for us to show the average annual five-year um, costing for each of the programs. So in the updated budget that you'll see, sorry, the updated inventory that you'll see in February, we will have that column there so that we're meeting the requirements of the, the regulation. And again, the province does recognize that you can use an alternative number in terms of your cost or expense for program delivery. You just have to be able to justify it. Um, sorry. So just to keep in mind some key items here when you're reviewing uh, this. So when you look at the municipal levy, these are sort of the estimated percentages that we assume would cost 
if we were using the, the new framework. So for example, flood forecasting and warning, we're anticipating that 82% would fall under municipal levy and 16% would fall under other federal or provincial um, funding. And then likewise a 2% in the reserves. So one of the things in terms of the reserves that I just wanted to mention is, um, so we have chosen to show in the reserves as a distinct revenue source. And this highlights where reserves are used to fund programs as part of an overall deliberate strategy of drawing down the reserves that were generated by setting aside funds from previous years that we now are accessing. So hopefully that doesn't, it wasn't intended to um, have a red flag for anybody in, in terms of that. So the other thing to keep in, other items to keep in mind is that the costs um, that are identified here will obviously be refined as we move to 2023 and 2024. The estimated um, percentages that you're seeing on here may fluctuate as well, particularly we start to negotiate MOUs with our partnering municipalities. Also want to identify that the GRCF is a legal separate entity and it provides funds to the GRCA through donations and that the GRCA uses the donations from the foundation to supplement some of our program areas. areas sorry. Hydro production costs include an amount that is allocated to reserves from an annual program revenue, which is consistent with the GRCA budget. And then the assumption here as well that's shown is that source water protection program is continued to be funded by the province. So the next two charts, the next two charts um, are ones that are requirements for us to meet the regulation and will be populated as we work our way through the process. So chart C is detailing um, the municipal agreements. So we have to provide the information of what programs and services they are um, and dates of when we enter into the agreements, keep a running list. And finally, for this one in particular, we do have a number of MOUs that we've already negotiated, particularly in the planning um, department. Um, unfortunately, those existing MOUs don't meet the requirements of the regulation, so we will have to work with our municipalities to renegotiate those so that they do meet the requirements. Chart D is all the information in terms of our Category 3 programs and services. And in terms of the requirements here, we have to identify, again, the applicable act, a description. We also have to identify if in the past they were um, financed through levy contribution and then um, identify the sources that in the new budget framework, how we're going to be funding those programs. Um, so in terms of next steps, I've said this a few times, but we are circulating the draft inventory to our partnering municipalities. We will be incorporating any feedback we receive today into the final inventory that's presented to the board um, at the end of February. And again, once all of this is approved, it is required to be submitted to MECP, circulated to our participating municipalities and posted on our website. Once this step is completed, um, we hope to start negotiations with the municipalities in the early spring to move forward with the category two and the MOUs that are required to support those programs and services. So Mr. Chair, I can appreciate that was a lot of information and I apologize if it was a bit dry to walk through, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. All right. Um, I'm sure everybody got all of it. <laughs> Quite a bit of stuff in there. And I, I wanna thank staff again for um, the, the difficult task they've got there. But you know, the, the benefit of course, is that it's all laid out now. You can see all these things, which is great. Bernie, you have a question or comment? I just have to uh, comment. I wish to uh, compliment both uh, the ad hoc committee and the staff for their excellent work they're doing in preparation and development of this strategic plan update. Great. Bruce Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, several questions, but I won't ask them all at once. Um, on the category one resource planning 
permits and environmental assessments. Um, just for cl clarification, who, who sets the regulations on uh, planning permits and environmental assessments? Is it provincial? Is it the conservation authorities, municipalities? Um, what, what standards are we, are we asked or are we responsible for reviewing to? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll ask Nancy just to say bye if she's on the line to fill in any gaps that I may identify. But at a really high level, um, under the new mandatory programs and services, it's identified through that that um, conservation authorities will provide comments to municipalities on planning um, related to natural hazards. And I believe we also have an MOU with the province to provide comments um, related to natural hazards under the provincial policy statement. In terms of the regulation, that's a section 28 regulation um, and our permitting <laughs> program that we have, that's administered through the Ministry of Natural Resources, Minings, they have a really big long name now, but basically MNRF um, is the one that manages that regulation. You may recall, Last year, the province mentioned that they will be updating that regulation as well through this suite of updates that they're doing. They just haven't um, uh, prepared the consultation guide that's going to go along with updating that regulation. So there's a number of, of things. So from the planning side, it's where, where we get into MOUs with the municipalities in terms of the scope and scale of the comments that we provide. But we also have an MOU with the province to, I think, review official plans and, and um, official plan amendments um, in relation to uh, the provincial policy is how it is to natural hazards. Nancy, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add, uh, suggest, is that there is also in the new regulation um, uh, other legislation that is right. specifically identified. So environmental assessments, drainage act, aggregate act were specifically included. So that's why you see a reference for natural hazards under category one to other legislation. Go ahead, Bruce. If, if I could, Mr. Chair, just so on uh, plans or comments on plans where it, it involves uh, regulated areas is is that set provincially and then incorporated into um, uh, the planning at the county level and then down to the municipal level or or where where does the where does the original uh, regulation start who does who does that determination and then the steps for it to be administered. Are we, do we have to comment as a conservation authority on every application or just those that are in regulated areas or natural hazards as you've outlined uh, before, Samantha? Um, I'll probably pass that to Nancy. You don't mind answering that one, Nancy? Sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because it does um, kind of speak to the integration of the program. So the provincial direction under permits is under the Conservation Authorities Act. So we are obligated to uh, review applications in regulated areas because of our own legislation. And then we are obligated to review uh, Planning Act applications now to determine if they're affected by natural hazards. So. Um, so we do try and work with municipalities to screen some applications. So if it's clear it's not in a natural hazard area, uh, and if we have an MOU with them um, as well, we're looking at the natural heritage features. So then some other, sometimes we, our MOUs are a little bit more extensive than that. So we will look at planning applications for natural hazards, natural heritage uh, assist in things like providing advice on stormwater management. Um, so the, the two are very integrated. I think the, the benefit of that integration is that the earlier in the, in the process, we can identify concerns. We do a lot of work up front in the planning process and get applications to a place that we can support them when they come forward for a permit. So, uh, so that's the benefit of having kind of those programs integrated. Does that answer your question? 
that what you got, Bruce? All right, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, as the chair said, this is very comprehensive and it's very good to see it all laid out. I really do appreciate that. Um, my concern is with the MOUs. We do. We have a number of MOUs now, do we not? Through you, Mr. Chair, we do. Now, the process of MOUs going forward, though, will it be the same process we've used in the past and the current MOUs we have now, or will, will these MOUs uh, all come before each individual council for, for a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Through you, Mr. Chair, so under the new regulations, um, the key, key difference between some of the MOUs that we have right now and the renegotiated ones that we're required to get, there has to be a financial component attached to it. And they do all have to be endorsed by council and the GRCA board. So okay. there is some additional steps. Yeah. That's what I was getting at. So, so you will negotiate that with staff. Staff, you know, if they're within their specific budgets now, um, well, they're not because they'd be in the actual funding. Uh, they would have to come back to members of council. This is my concern is how do we, what is, uh, what we have to have a good plan going forward, how these are presented. Otherwise, uh, the breakup of these starts happening piecemeal. And that's what I suspected was the intent of the legislation in the first place was to uh, break up all these categories where the MOUs are involved. So uh, we'll have to have a, will we have a team or we'll have a kind of a plan going forward how these MOUs and how these public presentations and to council are going to be dealt with? The councils. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair. So um, part of the assistance of the ad hoc committee is to um, be able to assist staff um, with that strategy. Um, the plan, the initial plan was to meet with staff and we have been invited to speak to some councils in the watershed about the phase one regulations and the requirements of the transition plan and the inventory. Um, I have finished meeting with majority of the participating municipalities and we seem to have very good staff support um, for that, but certainly, yes, we will be meeting with the ad hoc committee to go over draft templates, strategies, and bringing those reports back to the board as well in the okay. future. Okay, great, because I think, you know, the, the board members that uh, when it comes before the respective municipality will need to speak on behalf of these programs and be well prepared to do so. Thank you. Yes. I, I think you're correct, Richard. This is going to be one of the more difficult things that we're going to have to face with this. And it may be that 80% of them are smooth, right? But we're going to bump up, you know, with some councils or different things. And what do you do when the council changes every term? And there, there's, a, there's a real learning curve here, right? But I'm sure as we go forward, we'll develop a pretty good rhythm. Um, and staff's got some pretty good experience, but I'm with you. We're going to have to engage the board members. And in some cases, they might be easy and it's not a big deal. In other cases, it may take a lot more time and a lot more input from board members and chairs and so forth. So that'll be a hard part of this for sure. And then ongoing forever. So I'm sure over time, this thing is going to have to be tweaked a little bit. Okay. Is there anything further comments or questions on the uh, inventory and programs we have today? So there'll be obviously a lot more coming back and in February. So with that, I'm going to, if there's nothing further, I have a motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority draft inventory of programs and services be approved and that the draft inventory of program and services be circulated to all participating municipalities and that the inventory of programs and services be presented to the general membership for approval at the February meeting. Can I get it moved by Richard, seconded by Bruce Banbury. Uh, anything further? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. All right. Uh, strategic plan update. Sam, you just want to give a little blip then I'll. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is just um, a report to come to the board to demonstrate what staff have been working on um, throughout the last three years um, on the key objectives of the strategic plan. We, uh, I just want to thank staff and appreciate all their hard work. And you can see the amount of work that has been done given some of the challenges that we've had between 2019 and 2021 being mainly the pandemic. Um, that certainly has caused some challenges for staff, but they rose to the challenge and they've certainly done a great job at meeting a number of the key action items that were identified in the strategic plan. Given that we are going through um, the changes with the new regulation and we did have some delays with the COVID pandemic, my recommendation is that we do a minor update to the existing strategic plan. Um, the key uh, action items that um, were in the, the, the current strategic plan are still applicable at this time. 
Um, and staff have identified a number of additional action items that um, can uh, be added to those strategic objectives. One of the things too that we did want to highlight is that um, there are two significant um, strategic objectives we'd like to incorporate into the update. One being the governance around the requirements with the new regulations and to come in conformance with that. But as um, through many conversations we have had at the board in the last two years around Indigenous peoples and um, Indigenous affairs, we'd also like to incorporate um, a key action item into the strategic plan that um, directs staff to start developing stronger relationships um, with uh, the Indigenous communities. And I think in, you know, again, in the correspondence that was identified, there are a number of action items that GRCA can certainly um, improve on and we're willing to do. Um, my proposal is that in March, we'll come back to the board with some of those updated action items to get feedback um, on, uh, from the board on those items. And then we will continue forward with the update to the strategic plan for another two years, which will bring us into the first year of the new board from the election. And hopefully by that time as well in 2024, we'll have all the regulated requirements in place as well. So Mr. Chair, that's all I have to update the board on that. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Okay, I'm gonna put the motion on the floor and then we'll take questions. A motion that report number GM 01-2205, 2019 to 2021 strategic plan update be received as information. Moved by Catherine, seconded by John. Comments, questions? Uh, Bruce Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two or three questions. Uh, first of all, maybe just a comment. There was a mention made of flood damage assessments that are currently uh, funding has been approved for in Drayton and Grand Valley. And it, it uh, mentioned the township of Mapleton. Um, and I hope that uh, Guy doesn't think we've taken uh, Grand Valley away from Melanchthon. I'm pretty sure it should be uh, oh, township okay. of Melanchthon, Dufferin County, but uh, we are both working on uh, flood damage assessments. The other, or one of the other things, the, the wastewater treatment plant optimization program, uh, I've always been impressed with the success that you've had with that. And just wanted, have you looked at, or has there ever been a program to try to do the same thing with uh, wastewater lagoons or ponds, uh, as many of the smaller municipalities deal with, or are they pretty well left on their own to, to try to optimize the operation of those systems? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if Dwight's on the call, Dwight. I'll ask him. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, the wastewater optimization program can assist lagoon operators also. I believe there has been um, some work with uh, wastewater lagoon uh, operators also. Um, so it, it, it really deals with everything from lagoon type wastewater treatment facilities right up to the advanced facilities like the city of Guelph. So the program spans uh, the full range of wastewater facilities. All right, thanks Dwight. Bruce, yeah, there... thank you. That's fine. I have a couple more questions, yeah. but I'll let other members ask questions. No, no, no. no go ahead, Bruce. Okay, just uh, working our way through the the strategic uh, priorities. Um, what I, I know you did mention in there uh, a some sort of a uh, program on climate change or how we're going to deal with climate change. Um, with municipalities all having, at least in Wellington, I'm not sure if it's across the province or not, but all having to have their own climate change mitigation plans, uh, will we have some uh, training or, or knowledge that we can share with smaller municipalities as they go about developing climate change mitigation plans? And I, I know it's gonna involve tree planting, it's probably gonna, in agricultural areas, it's gonna involve a lot of things like cover crops and, and um, 
just the, the way we manage our runoff water and tile drainage and a whole lot of other things. Uh, where, what role will uh, GRCA be able to play in, in helping out uh, those municipalities with programs of that nature? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. So uh, we actually have had um, a few municipalities request that we participate on their committee um, that they're developing in terms of um, creating those plans and those reports. So we certainly um, have a number of staff who are qualified to sit on those committees. So depending on the angle, um, whether it's more an agricultural municipality versus an urban municipality, will sort of dictate in terms of which staff we ask to participate in that. Certainly a number of our programs that we provide could um, support some of the initiatives that the municipalities are looking at. So we're supporting our partners um, when they request. Um, and we have had quite a few who've reached out to us um, that where staff are participating uh, as members on those committees as well for the development of those action plans. Thanks, Sam. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, one, one other, and this is more comment, um, when you were looking at uh, invasive species uh, that you're monitoring, I know there are a couple new ones on there that I hadn't heard about, but I wonder if we should also add giant hogweed, or I'm wondering why that wasn't included. We have had a presentation on giant hogweed from concerned citizens, and maybe it's not an issue on GRCA property, but uh, I think it is still um along the the um the water course that could involve us uh, just whether there's no mission on purpose or whether it's just uh, not there because uh, we hadn't included it but i wanted for their sake uh to show that we do have an interest should it be included for you mr chair that's thank you thank you that an oversight um that was an oversight uh, on our part. We do have issues with giant hogweed on our property and we do deal with it. So that was simply just an oversight. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, you, is that good? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks, Bruce. Sue? Uh, thank you, Chair. And after me, I think Joan has her hand up. Um, I had the privilege of being at Loma this week and I met with 11 different ministers. It went very, very well. What was very, very interesting is um, the four townships in Waterloo Region got together to do a brief to the minister asking for us to be able to purchase um, or hire an individual that would help us map through how to meet the 50-30 and the 80-50 uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And um, he loved it. He was ready to write the check right away. As soon as I got off of a meeting with him, he called my CAO and they're getting it working. So if you can get a few municipalities to go together and say that you want this, I think he would back it 100%. That's exactly what he's looking for. Is us not each doing our individual project, but working with our neighboring municipalities and coming together uh, for a common goal. So we'll share this person who will create a plan for how we working together can help to eliminate the greenhouse gas emissions. I can't believe how I, Roma was great. I had four ministries contact my CAO before the day was out. And uh, so collaboration is a good way to go. Just, just a, an FYI for you individual municipalities. If you do want to attempt to work together, the province loves it. And I got that constantly from the ministries. Thanks, Sue. Uh, Joan, did you have your hand up or was Sue just making that up? Thank you, Mr. Chair, I did. And um, I just wanted to say, while we mentioned about wastewater treatment optimization, um, I'd like to congratulate uh, the city of Brantford because I read recently where they achieved the gold standard on their wastewater plant and was part of the program. And I was glad that Bruce brought that up as well as the hogweed because I noticed hogweed wasn't listed specifically, but thought perhaps it was just in the invasive, invasive species that were listed. So thank you, Bruce. And I'm hoping the volunteers that are working on hogweed don't get discouraged. And could staff tell me, did we ever give them or did they apply 
for a grant? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, not that I'm aware of. They did not, uh, that they applied for a grant. I think that the challenge um, with giant hogweed and is we struggle with it for sure on our, our own property. And that's where the focus of our invasive species management is on GRCA owned land. I think their challenge is that they were dealing with just the, the entire watershed up and down the side banks of the river and looking for access um, through private property to deal with some of the issues. But um, no, we didn't provide a grant um, for them uh, to remove giant hogweed on, on private property. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there's nothing further, I'm not sure it's been so long. Did I put that motion on the floor? Probably not. I'm going to put it back on anyway. No, you did. You did, Catherine and John. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So if there's nothing further, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving on to the budget 2022 draft number two. I'm not putting that on the floor until we've had our chat so I don't confuse myself. All right. Um, are there any questions on the draft budget? That'll be coming back at the AGM in February. We've seen this a number of times. So at this point, we're just trying to see if there's anything further anybody has some questions around. Okay, seeing none, the motion that report number 012206 budget 2022 draft number two be received as information and that an amount equal to any undesignated surplus realized from the 2021 year end operating results be transferred to the transition reserve at the end of 2021. Mover please. Bernie seconded by Ian. Any opposed? That's carried, thank you very much. Moving along to a couple of Quickie items here, motion. I'm at 12.5, motion. That report number GM 012201, cash and investment status, December 2021 be received as information. Moved by John, seconded by Kathy. Any opposed? Carried, thank you. 12.6, motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority retain WASCO to provide waste collection and recycling bin services for conservation areas, head office and nature centers for a term of three years and an option to extend the contract for up to two additional one-year terms. Moved by Ian, seconded by Marcus. Questions, any opposed? Carried, 12-7. Motion that report number GM 012202, development interference with wetlands and alterations to shorelines and watercourses regulation be received as information. Moved by Catherine, seconded by Jerry. Questions, seeing none. Any opposed? Carried. 12-8, motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority accept the bid from Stantec Consulting Limited to carry out the Speed River hydraulic model development at a cost of $123,439, excluding HST and at a contingency of 10% be included in the overall project budget for a total project budget of $135,769, excluding HST. Moved by Sue, seconded by Bob. Questions, seeing none. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. We're up to the watershed conditions. Dwight, do you wanna give us a little hello or not? No. Okay, I think I'm on now. I was having problems with technology. Um, one thing I would, a uh, couple of things I would like to comment on. Um, I know um, we're starting to see some ice in the river. And I know, you know, residents through the southern portion of the river, like the city of Brantford, um, I'm sure get anxious when they start to see ice in the river, given um, the flooding that we had in 2018. But conditions right now are different than they were in 2018. We don't have a pre-existing ice jam in the river. Um, ice has started to accumulate, but there's capacity in the river between the banks and capacity in the floodplain um, to provide relief. Um, so we'll be monitoring ice conditions uh, through the Brantford Reach very closely. Um, and if we need to message about conditions there, we will. 
Um, but, um, you know, I think it's important to just be aware that uh, residents that had their homes flooded in 2018 likely are anxious right now. Uh, it's been a cold January. Uh, we're aware of that and, and we'll certainly message out as needed. We also had a really good meeting with um, the municipality of, of uh, emergency management folks from Brant County, City of Brantford, and First Six Nations. Uh, it was headed up by the emergency management uh, coordinator for Brant County. It was very effective. We've uh, done a lot of planning, had good discussions, um, and uh, they're advancing their, their flood emergency plans in those municipalities and uh, certainly wanted to acknowledge uh, the pre-planning that's being done there. Uh, it's uh, you know, proactive and, and that's what we like to see. Um, I'll take any questions. Certainly right now we're into a bit of a stable weather condition. There is a little bit of uh, weather moving in next week that'll bring a, a, a short burst of, of mild temperatures, but at this time we're not expecting uh, that that would trigger uh, any major flooding. But obviously, this time of year, we watch the weather very closely. Through you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, just a little activity at the door. Um, Bernie, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Uh, I know there is a good number of ice huts on the lower ground, indicating to me that there is a good ice buildup. But I'm always worried about the availability of the icebreaker to come through? Is it on notice at times or how does that work out? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, what we do is we, we monitor conditions and if we foresee that there's gonna be a potential breakup, um, then what we do is work with Haldeman County. The request to the province actually has to go from the community emergency coordinator in, in Haldeman County it goes up to the Provincial Emergency Operations Center and then across to the federal government to, to make the request. And then we have contacts uh, with the Coast Guard out of their, uh, their Montreal Operations Center and they coordinate uh, with the Coast Guard. So we have a very good working relationship uh, with the Coast Guard folks and uh, with the emergency management folks in Haldeman County. Um, very clear process on how we request and basically we monitor watershed conditions so that we bring the icebreaker in at the appropriate time. Bringing it, bring it in too early or too late is not effective. So uh, um, we can't make them or keep them on standby, but we give them appropriate lead time when needed to, uh, to make their way to uh, the mouth of the river. All right, Dwight, thank you. It's a good update. Are there any questions from the board? Comments or questions? All right, I have a motion that report number GM 012207, current watershed conditions as of January 19, 2022 be received for information. Moved by Richard, seconded by Catherine. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move into a closed meeting. So I have a motion that the general membership enter a closed meeting in accordance with the Municipal Act section 239 for the following purposes. A proposed or pending acquisition or disposition, security of property and advice that is subject to uh, solicitor client privilege. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Marcus, seconded by Warren. <coughs> are we are we back? Hey. Yep, okay. the live stream's resumed. All right, I wanna welcome everyone back. Um, just a couple of items out of our closed session. First one is motion that the minutes of the previous closed session be received and approved as circulated. Moved by Marcus, seconded by John. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. This, this is gonna be fun. Motion, in order to further the objects of the Grand River Conservation Authority by assisting a member municipality in providing municipal services that the property described as 320-50-0322 part. Do, do I need to read this? Can we put this up on the screen? Uh, I, I can't, however, everyone would have received a copy of the agenda. Okay, that was my thought. And, and members of the public, this is on the website. Yes? Yes. Oh, okay, because yes. it's, it's, it, it's basically just technical stuff. So I have a motion, uh, I'm gonna start again. 
in order to further the objects of the Grand River Conservation Authority by assisting a member of municipality in providing municipal services that the property described as, and you can find that in your notes <clears throat> uh, and so forth, et cetera, be transferred to Brent County at a nominal consideration of $2. Any questions? Uh, uh, sorry, moved by Richard, seconded by Sue. Are there any questions on that? I will read it if you need me to. It's just, it's technical. It's okay, good. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. And moving right along to elections. Um, I guess I'm going to be welcoming Wendy Wright Cassidy. Is she here? Wendy is the uh, chair of the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Committee and will preside over the election of officers as acting chair. We're also joined by Janelle Vene and Sarah Clayton from KPMG who will act as scrutineers. I will vacate the chair. Turn it over to Wendy, I'm guessing, Sam? Yes, please. Is she, I, see, I want to... Wendy is, uh, is connected. She's just on mute. There we go. Oh, there she is yeah. at the bottom. I see her. I'm good. Thank you. Hello, Wendy. I'll turn the whole thing over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, declare that the offices of chair and vice chair are vacant. The board will appoint at least one scrutineer who is not staff or a member of the authority to assist with the election. And I'd like you to welcome Janelle Vanny and Sarah Clayton from KPMG. Okay. So we just, we need a motion to appoint. I have a motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority appoint Janelle Vanny and Sarah Clayton as scrutineers for the purpose of electing officers of the general membership. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Ian McRae, mover, and Bruce Banbury, seconder. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried, thank you. I want to advise the members that the election will be conducted in accordance with the Conservation Authorities Act and at this point, I'd like to call for nominations for the position of chair. Um, I'm just having a little trouble with my view here. So I'm just doing an adjustment. Thank you. Okay, can I have a... Um, Wendy, if I may, my name's Sue Fox and I nominate Chris White for chair. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, I have a... Um, Second call for nominations for chair. Third call for nominations for chair. Um, I have a motion that nominations for the position of chair for the Grand River Conservation Authority general membership be closed. Can I, I have a, thank you, Bernie. Seconder, John Chalner. Thank you, all in favor? Opposed, if any? Thank you very much. For the um, position of vice chair, I'm oh. calling for nominations for the position of vice chair. Sorry, I, I believe we announced the results for the oh, chair I'm, position first. I'm sorry. Um, Chris White was um, unanimously elected as the chair for uh, the Grand River Conservation Authority. And congratulations, Chris. Um, I think you have some experience with this already. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And I want to thank everybody on the board for their support. I've got about a 40 page speech I'll give just at the end of the meeting. <laughs> but thank you. We'll wait with it. We'll wait for that. Um, after adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need a motion for a nomination for the position of vice chair. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing if somebody has their hand up. Richard, Richard? has his hand. Thank uh, you, Richard. Richard Carpenter, I nominate Sue Fox and for vice chair. Thank you, Richard. Um, 
I, uh, the, the position of vice chair then is acclaimed um, and I could invite Sue Foxton to uh, say a few words. Thank you. My words are incorporated at Chris White's 40 page speech. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, you for allowing me to run again, guys. And I'll turn this um, back over to Chris and um, he can start his 40 page speech. All right, if everybody's relaxed and got a coffee. I was born. Anyway, um, thanks very much. I appreciate the, uh, the support. It's, it's, it's absolute pleasure working on this board. And I, I'm not blowing smoke. You're a great board. It's very interesting. Always something new happening. And this is certainly a, an interesting time to be sitting here. I'm sure Helen can, and Jane can appreciate that. And uh, once again, thank you very much. And welcome back, Sue. Appreciate that. All right. Um, do we need... Where are we now then? Do we need a motion to destroy? Oh, there are no, no election. All right. So is that it? I guess we're on to end of meeting. That's, is that correct? Uh, okay. So before we, it is. thank you, Wendy, very much. And Sarah and folks for, and Janelle for coming up. We appreciate you taking the time to uh, enjoy our exciting election. I'm sure the midterms down in the States will be a little more fun for you. All right. Chair, if I may, before we adjourn, sure. could we recognize Warren Stout? I, I, yeah, no, I'm going to, I wasn't, I was going to let Warren uh, give us some entertainment before he goes, but Warren, I'll just turn the floor over to you if the board is all right with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to both you and Sue on your appointments. Uh, we are thrilled to have you guys in charge. So um, good morning, board members and staff. I was recently reminded by a friend who was also a longtime supporter of the GC, GRCA, that 2022 marks the 28th anniversary of the Heritage River designation of the Grand River in 1994. That designation recognized the outstanding human heritage values and excellent recreational opportunities along the Grand River waterways. It was the first time that an, an entire watershed had received a Heritage River designation. And as a result of the Heritage River, de River designation, a document called the Grand Strategy was produced. This document described a vision for how the river would be managed and its values, uh, heritage values maintained. Yearly and 10 year monitoring reports are prepared by GRCA staff and submitted to the Canadian Heritage Rivers Board to ensure that the river continues to maintain the values for which it was designated. The reports, if you haven't read them, you can view on grandriver.ca. There's a detail of the human heritage and recreational values. 2024 will mark the 30th year of designation. Maybe it's time to do something special. In 1995, the Heritage Working Group, made up of volunteers from watershed municipalities, Parks Canada, museums, universities, heritage groups, indigenous groups, and the Green River Conservation Authority was established. The committee held monthly meetings in a 1996 plan and held its first Heritage Day workshop. Over the past 20 years or so, um, some of you may have attended and along with thousands of citizens of the watershed, these very successful and popular day-long Heritage Day events that were held in a variety of watershed municipalities. The workshops were held in mid-February, close to the Heritage slash Family Day weekend. Weekend workshops have not been held since 2018 due to a number of factors, one of which was COVID-19. However, a friend reminded me, if there would be a Heritage Day workshop in February, 2022, it would probably be held in Cambridge. The theme, hockey, Canada's game. The venue might be the Galt Arena Gardens, the beautiful Galt Arena Gardens, located at 98 State Street, which re recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. Built in 1921 throughout the year and opened in 1922, it is the oldest continuously operating ice hockey arena in the world. Now, the Heritage Day program. Well, we uh, talked about the theme. Possibly the program would include it. 
building, the building's architecture. The arena is noted for its impressive external facade. Hockey teams and players who played there could be part of the program. Other old arenas in the watershed could be featured. Famous hockey players from the watershed. Let me see, do we have any? How about Wayne Gretzky from Brantford? Sil Apps from Paris. The Kraut Line, Bobby Bauer, Milt Schmidt, and Woody Dumart from Kitchener. Daryl Sittler from St. Jacobs. Rod and Rick Sealing from Amira. Howie Maker from New Hamburg, and many, many, many more. Famous hockey teams, the Kitchener Waterloo Dutchman, who represented Canada at the 1956 Winter Olympics in Cortina d'Ampiso, Italy, and in 1960 at the Squaw Valley Games in Colorado. The Guelph Biltmores, the Galt Terriers, wonderful hockey teams. Congratulations to Mayor McGarry and the citizens of Cambridge for maintaining such a wonderful heritage building. Well done. And just as we are talking now about Winter Olympics, the first Winter Olympic Games were held January the 25th to February the 4th, 1924 in Chamonix, Mont Blanc, France, in the French Alps. Canada was represented by the Toronto Granites, who won Canada's uh, gold in ice hockey, Canada's only medal. Uh, William Hewitt, father of Foster Hewitt and, and grandfather Bill Hewitt, legendary play-by-play -play broadcasters, was the coach of that team. Canada does rock. Go Canada, go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Warren. Some, some pent-up announcements there. Bruce? Well? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just before, uh, before you adjourn the, the meeting, I did see an article in the Farm Press. It's actually called Today's Farmer uh, that just came out this week talking about a Grand River watershed group that want to increase the land being protected in the watershed by 10 times up to 532,000 hectares. And the name of the group is the Greenbelt West Coalition. And I think uh, a lot of different groups are involved with this or in this coalition, a lot of them in Brant County but the uh, Wellington Water Watchers, uh, Protect Our Moraine, Concerned Citizens of Push Lynch and Hike Ontario or some of the other that are involved. And I'm not sure if you have access to it. I could make a copy of it, but it's an awkward size of a, a paper. But the author was Vincent Ball and he works with Post Media. And it just, the headline was New Coalition Calls for Groundwater and Farmland Safeguards. And I'm not sure if it involves or should involve Conservation Authority or not, but just so you're aware that there is a request that, that uh, had a press conference in December, I believe. Okay, thanks, Bruce. All right, well, uh, again, I wanna thank everybody. And uh, just one thing before you go, Warren, you know, the Biltmore, hat, Biltmore team in Guelph, you know, that's where hat trick came from, right? Yeah, okay. Guy scores three goals, he got a free hat. Okay, if there's nothing further, I will officially call the meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. And Mover we'll and seconder. You, uh, sorry, to adjourn? Seconded by Sue. Yeah. Mover? Uh, Marcus. Thank you. It's really hard to get out. All right, <laughs> any opposed? <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you very much. We'll see you all soon. Take care, everyone. Chris, I scored three goals in my 